Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It's Friday, July 8th, 2016. Here are our top stories. Tonight, the ambush in Dallas. Dramatic raw video from the shooting captures the real horror of the event. Despicable Facebook users celebrate the slaughter of Dallas police. Plus, Alex Jones breaks down how Black Lives Matter is a domestic terrorist organization. Of course, our top story today is the tragedy in Dallas at the Black Lives Matter protest. As the protest was ending, uh, at least one, perhaps more snipers. That's one of the most interesting things about this. We were told uh, that it was initially a triangulated shooting. That's the way the Dallas police report it. Now that they have uh, killed an individual, they're saying he was the lone shooter. Isn't it interesting? It's always a lone shooter. Nevertheless, at this time, the uh, tally stands as five police officers dead, seven wounded, two bystanders wounded. You don't hear too much about that, actually. Uh, it's being all blamed right now on a former corporal, Micah Xavier Johnson. Uh, and now we've seen copycat shootings happening across the country. We've seen in Tennessee that a shooter targeted white victims. Now, these people that were shot, let me read you who they were. This is a newspaper carrier. Jennifer Rooney was killed. Uh, she was shot while she was driving her vehicle, delivering newspapers, perhaps, or maybe she was off of work. She was killed. Deborah Watts, in serious but stable condition, shot while working at a day's end. Another person received minor injuries at the scene after being injured by flying glass, resulting from gunfire. And Officer Matthew Cousins sustained a superficial wound to the leg. I think he was the one who stopped the shooter. But understand, these people, none of them, not even the police officer who was there, had anything at all to do with these shootings in question that the uh, protests were about. This is in Tennessee. So this is the climate that we have here. And in order to understand this climate, you need to understand the mindset that is being sold to people by our political establishment, as we're going to get to here in a moment, our educational establishment. Because that's really where this began, I believe. Goes back to Obama's mentor, Bill Ayers, and the educational establishment. That's where they invented white privilege. Now, as we look at this, just understand that if there's a hate crime, there's hatred on the right, it is the fault of the person on the right, we're told. But if there's hatred and violence from somebody on the left, guess who caused it? Somebody on the right. See, it's always people on the right who are to blame, okay? It's never the left who is to blame. They can never generate the hatred on their own, or so we're told. And of course, if it's a, a black person uh, that does this, it's still the fault of a white person somewhere. Now, Jesse Jackson is a perfect example of this. He's blaming Trump for this. Uh, this is <laughs> Jesse Jackson speaking in the aftermath of the coordinated attack on 11 police in Dallas. Uh, he called on President Obama to hold a conference on violence and racial disparities. Keep drumming up the racism here, he says. And this is an interview that he did in London. He said, it's kind of an anti-black mood, anti-Semitism, anti-Muslim bashing, immigrant bashing, female bashing, a kind of mean-spirited division in the country. There you go. It's all Trump's fault. And I, I, quite frankly, I don't understand where they get this because he's been talking about immigration and black people are not immigrating into this country. We're talking about other issues. It's probably the one area that we're not getting a lot of immigration from, okay? But then, of course, we have Barack Obama and uh, Attorney General Lynch joining in and encouraging Black Lives Matter to keep this up. Attorney General Lynch said members of Black Lives Matter movement need to keep letting their voices be heard. And Obama, while he blames guns and gun owners and says this is another reason we have to have gun control, he goes on to say that uh, when people say Black Lives Matter, it doesn't mean that blue lives don't matter. Well, he ought to look at social media because there's been a lot of Twitter wars and Facebook wars over that very issue. No, they don't like the fact that you use a All Lives Matter hashtag. This is about creating tribalism and racial division. And he comes out and says just the opposite. He says, right now the data shows black folks are more vulnerable to these kinds of incidents. There's a particular burden that is being placed on a group of our fellow citizens. So he blames it on firearms and he blames it again on division. 
And yet, we hear from the black police chief in Dallas that the shooting suspect wanted to kill white people and police officers, preferably white police officers, and that's what he did. As a matter of fact, uh, he expressed uh, his anger about Black Lives Matter, and that's what he said. He wanted to target people on a racial basis. We have another black law enforcement officer, David Clark, Milwaukee County Sheriff, coming out and saying, well, you know, quite frankly, it's coming from Obama. It's not coming from Trump. He says he didn't cause this, but you know what? He sort of fuels this anger, that misplaced anger, about things going on that were thousands of miles away. And again, Obama and Loretta Lynch still fuel that anger in what they're doing. And you have to look at this and say, are we going to allow them to focus us on the guns or on the immediate issues here? Can we understand the long-term strategy these people have been laying out for a very long time? This is something, as I mentioned before, this is a race war. And it's a race war that's been planned and developed for a long time, along with many other aspects. One of the aspects of this is to militarize the police. It is a problem and then a solution. Once they militarize the police, then they create a problem. They tell them to shoot first. Once they shoot, empty the gun and whoever you're shooting at. That is a radical change from the way the police operated just 20 years ago, maybe even just 15 years ago, pre-9-11. That is a radical change. It's coming from the federal government. As this creates problems, what do they do? They step up the militarization, and they call for more control of the police at the federal level, and yet that is the very problem. That's one aspect of it. But the other direction in which they come at us is with education. You have to understand that they sell you a false dichotomy, a political map that gives us uh, these bipolar extremes, okay? They tell you everything's going to be divided, left, right, Democrat, Republican. Uh, red and blue, or people of color and white people, okay? How simple is that? Can you make it any simpler, any more simple-minded? You know, they also give you the uh, dichotomy of everything is either fascism or communism if they're coming at us. Look, understand that Hitler and Stalin were one and the same. They were authoritarian dictators. They were totalitarian regimes that ruled by brutality and mass murder. It's what we call democide. If you have it on a proper political spectrum, like the Nolan chart, you can see that they both wind up in the same place, and they both call themselves socialists. So it doesn't matter what your justification is, whether it's nationalism or whether it is internationalism. They want to enact authoritarianism, and that is what socialism leads us to. Where this came from, if you want to know the roots of this and where this is immediately descended from, look at Bill Ayers, someone who began as a... Uh, I guess we could call him a failed terrorist, somebody who came in very, the very embodiment of white privilege. This guy had a father who was a, a CEO of Con Ed, very wealthy individual, and yet he became a very known, uh, well-known terrorist with the Weather Underground. It was interesting, last October, when they were changing the Department of Education head, uh, he said, I'm available officially to be the next Secretary of Education. Now, he tweeted that out as a joke on Twitter, but you know, it's interesting that the person who was, being, who was leaving at that point, uh, an individual named Duncan, uh, who left in December, was previously CEO of the Chicago Public Schools. And that's where all of this stuff is coming from, quite frankly. When we look at the history of the Weather Underground, the fact they bombed banks, they bombed the Pentagon uh, with other people, interestingly enough, with the Black Panthers, they tried to do a uh, truck heist of $1.6 million. That failed. Uh, it resulted in the murder of a Brinks guard and two police officers. And then from 1970 to 73, Ayers' wife, Bernadine Dornan, expressed support for Charles Manson and his followers. Why? Because they killed pigs, because they killed cops. Are you starting to see a pattern here? You're going to see more of a pattern here. Ayers ultimately got off because the FBI did some illegal snooping. But of course, nobody gets off for that anymore. Uh, Hillary Clinton gets off no matter what she does. But the rest of us don't get off because of illegal snooping, because they're illegally, illegally snooping on all of us. We would all be immune from all prosecution and have diplomatic immunity. But he beat the rap. The ultimate white privilege. Here's a guy who comes from a really wealthy background. He engages in all this terrorism, and then he walks. And he, not only does he walk, but he gets a PhD, and he goes in to do something that is really dangerous, to change our educational system. I want to go back to some quotes uh, from a 1970 book 
called Weatherman. This is by Harold Jacobs. Now, he was very supportive of the Weather Underground and their means. And here's some of the things that he said, and see if this doesn't sound like our white privilege social justice warriors that are being brainwashed in our universities today. He says that uh, at the time, they warned against a one-sided response to what Weatherman refers to as white skin privilege. That was their original term. That was the term from which we get white privilege. They called it white skin privilege. He says he refuses to succumb to the despair implicit in the Weatherman's belief that the majority of whites in this country might be too racist, too defeated, too self-indulgent to make a revolution for themselves. Sound familiar? That's what we hear from the university students. Going on with this. They tied themselves closely to the black liberation movement. They felt it was the most important element of the whole process. He says, as part of the third world opposition, it could eventually bring down the imperial system. The role of white radicals is primarily, although importantly, supportive and extensive. See the technique that they're using here? Focusing on black people, ginning up the anger, using them to start a war, and using the white radicals to push that. And of course, you have to make them radical by selling them the idea of white skin privilege. It's all originated with Bill Ayers and the Weathermen. Strategically, they say, work should concentrate on building citywide movements that are based on intensive youth organizing across a whole range of issues. That's your community organizer network. That's how they put this together. And so we're seeing the results of this. One more quote here. This is from his wife, uh, Bill Ayer's wife, Bernadine Dorn. She said, white youth must choose sides now. They must either fight on the side of the oppressed or be on the side of the oppressor. You can't just be a bystander. You can't just be an innocent individual. No, you are a guilty oppressor if you don't join with Black Lives Matter. We've heard this all before. Why do you think they're pushing so hard for universal free college education? It's because their program of indoctrination, that's what the colleges have become. They're not so much education anymore, okay? Especially if you don't major in something technical. If you go for a liberal arts education or some of these other uh, degrees that don't qualify you for any job other than working for the federal government, they are going to indoctrinate you into the worldview of Bill Ayers. How did he get to this point where he was so successful? Take a look at an article that's... Uh, back in December of 2013, this is from Breitbart, and they talk about the educational connections and the common core roots that go back to Bill Ayers. And they point out that Barack Obama didn't simply embrace a concept that others had developed. Instead, the very roots of common core are in the early ideas generated by Obama and his fellow radical community organizer, Bill Ayers. And they point out something that as he was running for president, Stanley Kurtz uh, pointed out, that uh, Obama's, quote, most important executive experience was to head up the Chicago Annenberg Challenge, the CAC. He said it was an education foundation that was the invention of Bill Ayers, who, of course, founded the Weather Underground in the 1960s. Now, Obama was the executive in charge of it from 1995 to 1999. He remained on the board until 2001, and the foundation funneled more than $100 million into community organizations and radical education activists. The CAC's stated purpose was to improve Chicago's public schools. Now, as chairman, Obama handled the fiscal matters, but Bill Ayers co-chaired the CAC's other key entity, the Collaborative, and there he influenced education policy. You see, if you want to destroy society, you don't blow up buildings, you don't shoot the police. What you do is you go into the educational establishment and you foment these ideas for a generation. And then you start a mass movement of people who will do those very things for you. Okay, that's ultimately where they're going and that's where we're starting to see this now. Where did this come from? It was a long-term plan by these 1960s radicals who got smart, who went into education. Because if you can get people's minds at an early age, everybody has always understood this. Every dictator has understood this. It's why Hitler had the Hitler Youth. It's why Plato, going back to ancient Greece, when he's talking about his republic, that's why he wanted to destroy the family. He wanted promiscuity so that nobody would know who their mothers and fathers were. He wanted to have the state raise the child, this child only being loyal to the state. Get them at an early age, and they're yours for the rest of their life, especially if you can carry them all the way into college and indoctrinate them. 
Uh, now, he goes on to say in this article here, implementing Ayer's radical philosophy in schools required them to associate with external partners, people that we've heard of before, like ACORN, okay? Heard of ACORN before, right? The CAC, as it was closing down, they created another pilot program called the GROW Network that was starting up in New York. ACORN, GROW Network, the connection in New York as well as in Chicago, and quite frankly, the guy who did get the job as uh, the uh, new chair of the Department of Education was from New York. It's New York, Chicago, the liberals who control those areas, the community organizers, the communist organizers, quite frankly. Now, this is founded by David Coleman, who is known as the architect of Common Core Standards. Here's the connection. Common Core. They do not want Johnny to read or write. They want Johnny to hate. They want to fill you with nothing but contempt and tribalism and not have the means of production. They don't want you focused on creating things, on creating jobs, on creating widgets. They want to create strife and division and take this down. So they created this uh, GROW network in New York. Out of that came Common Core. That is where we are today, folks. When we come back, we're going to talk about Hillary Clinton. She actually spoke today because she had the cover of the Dallas tragedy. We're going to talk about the timing of all this. We're going to talk about the response and the fallout with Hillary Clinton because we're not going to let her get away with using this as cover. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Timing is everything. And this last week when we saw what happened with Hillary Clinton and the conclusion of the FBI's investigation into her, the timing should tell you that the fix was in. We could see this at the beginning of the week. And of course, it only got worse as the week progressed. And we learned that the deposition was going to be on perhaps the slowest news day of the year, the Saturday before 4th of July weekend. To back that up, take a look at what the AP says about ratings during this period of time. And they say it was no fun for Fox News. The network recorded the lowest ever viewership average for a week by one of the four biggest broadcast networks. Now, it wasn't a bad week in general compared to everybody else for Fox. They say Fox News Channel was the week's most popular cable network. Nevertheless, they say because of barbecues, fireworks, other outdoor activities, the weeks around July 4th are often the least watched time of the year in television. Networks usually plan accordingly, and so do crooked politicians. They plan accordingly. They release their news on a Friday because they know that people aren't going to be paying that much attention, and they release the really big exposures on the 4th of July weekend, something that's really damaging. Look, they're going to have the Guccifer hearings coming up on Labor Day. You think that's a coincidence? It's not a coincidence. It shows you that the fix has been in. Now, as we look at this, and as this begins to un continues to unfold, Hillary Clinton didn't respond until today. But people were talking about it earlier in the day. They said, well, Clinton faces a tough decision as to whether or not she's going to address the media about the FBI. That was the headline from The Hill. And The Washington Post says, well, here's exactly how long it's been since Hillary Clinton held a news conference. Because remember, Loretta Lynch didn't hold a news conference. She didn't hold a press conference. She talked to one friendly interviewer who was throwing her softball questions and helping her to present a narrative to diffuse the situation, saying, oh, you wouldn't throw a former president off of the plane, would you? And you guys are just good friends. So that's why you didn't recuse yourself. <laughs> that's one of the prime reasons you would recuse yourself, but especially when you're caught on the tarmac in a tete-a-tete -tete with the uh, former president whose wife is under investigation, who himself is under investigation, sources say. But how long has it been since Hillary Clinton held a press conference? So the Washington Post points out it was December the 4th, 2015. They went back and said, well, it's 216 days. Now it's 217 days because it was yesterday they asked that. So people were saying, why isn't she holding a press conference? Well, today she had a one-person interview with Wolf Blitzer on CNN, the Clinton News Network, where he asked her some softball questions and let her get away with it like this. Do you acknowledge you were extremely careless? Well, I think the director clarified uh, that comment to some extent, uh, pointing out that some of what uh, had been thought to be classified apparently was not. The State Department also uh, made that clear. So you see how she rolls this out? She waits until the day when everybody is preoccupied with the tragedy in Dallas, and then she tells another lie. She said the director pointed out that some of the things that he thought were classified weren't. But he pointed out that there were a lot of things that were sent and received 
as classified documents. He laid out the case for a felony, then he let her walk. And as I said, this was orchestrated. Take a look at what Jerome Corsi at WND pointed out about Comey's long history of helping the Clintons. Now he goes back and talks, first of all, 2004. Comey, who was then Deputy Attorney General in the Justice Department, limited the scope of criminal investigation for the Sandy Berger case. Now he's always, and always will be, referred to in my family as, the, as Sandy the Burglar Berger. Why? Because he went into the National Archives, took out classified documents, was caught stuffing them in his pants, in his pockets, walked them out of the place, and then was allowed to destroy them outside the uh, National Archives. Why was he doing that? He was doing it to cover up some of the security violations and machinations and conspiracy plots, evidently, of the Clinton administration. The first one, Bill Clinton. The buildup to the 9-11 terrorist attacks. He wanted that information out of there because it showed a pattern of behavior that people were starting to tie together with what happened in 9-11. So he destroyed all those documents. You want to talk about the missing 28 pages? What about all these pages that their close associate, Sandy Berger, stuffed in his pants, okay, and got out? Now, Mr. Comey helped him get away with that. Mr. Comey and Loretta Lynch were both U.S. attorneys in the Southern District of New York, and they crossed paths in the investigation of HSBC, the bank that was too big to jail, just like Hillary Clinton. Remember the bank that laundered money for terrorists and for drug cartels and did it not once, but twice. And it was the second time people said, wait a minute, you already gave them probation. Why are you, what are you going to do now? You're going to jail some of these people? You're going to pull their charter? No, no, said uh, Eric Holder's Justice Department. They're too big to jail, essentially. And Lynch and Comey were a part of that. Don't forget also that he was also a part, going back to 1996, 20 years ago. Remember, there were a lot of scandals as Bill Clinton was running for re-election in 1996. There were scandals of selling influence to the Chinese government, of uh, the money flowing into the Democrats uh, committee, as well as to the Clintons. There was also a whitewater investigation. And part of that whitewash was, guess who? James Comey, who was deputy special counsel back in 1996 as part of the whitewater whitewash. Now, as we had a questioning of Comey on Capitol Hill, they asked him, well, could she have been fired? And he said, well, uh, I'm highly confident that there would be no criminal prosecution no matter who it was, he said, but there would be a range of discipline if this were to happen. He said, you could be walked out or depending on the nature of the facts, you could be reprimanded. The director also said that sitting FBI officials might lose their security clearance. They might have their clearances reviewed or to be subject to other adjudication on the same matter. In other words, if she was just an employee, she might have been fired. And of course, we've seen what happened to people like whistleblowers, especially uh, Thomas Drake, who they <laughs> classified documents that were in his possession that were not classified and said, well, they're not classified. You should have known that they were misclassified and... Uh, uh, so we're going to charge you with having classified documents. When she had documents that came into her possession immediately that were born classified, they allowed her to walk on that. An amazing double standard. We've talked to that, about that before. But now the State Department is going to reopen a probe into the Clinton emails. Because even though Hillary couldn't be fired, they're going to look for some people to scapegoat and to fire out of the Department of, out of the State Department. We have Marco Rubio leading the Senate to push a bill to strip Hillary of her security clearance. Does that sound like that's overly partisan to you? Understand that during Bill Clinton's administration, John Deutsch, who was the director of the CIA, did exactly what Hillary Clinton did, had classified documents on his personal computer at home. He was not only fired, but he was stripped of his security clearance. And in order to keep him from going to jail, he was pardoned by Bill Clinton for that as well. And there's one other possible consequence that may come up, but it's not a consequence at all. They say they may have a referral for perjury for Hillary Clinton. They asked the director if, uh, they, if anybody had talked to him about her committing perjury to Congress. And he says, well, uh, nobody has referred that to us. And they said, well, we'll get that to you right away. But understand, what are, who's going to do the investigation? Oh, well, that would be Comey, wouldn't it? And who would make the decision as to whether or not they were going to prosecute her? Oh, that would be Loretta Lynch. So you understand absolutely nothing is going to happen with that. 
Now, real quickly, on another subject, a judge report has pointed out that Christiana Figueres, a former climate change chief who helped to push through the Paris Climate Change Accord, may become the new head of the UN. <laughs> Look at her right there. Now, it's interesting, look at her name. And of course, the way the Dredge Report it was Christiana. I guess the way we would pronounce that would be Anna Christ, because uh, it may very well be, as Alex Jones pointed out in his special report, may very well be the people who come in and mop up the revolution that Bill Ayers and Obama want to start with this race war. And as we look at this, understand that world government, I believe, is going to come at us through the uh, trade treaties that are being pushed, because that's the way they push consolidation politically, is through economic consolidation, as well as giving a rationale for a global governance through climate change. That is the imperative that they have to push to people. That is what people are concerned about on the Democrat side and Hillary side, that uh, Bernie Sanders is going to try to push that too hard. They want to bring it on you gradually. But things are beginning to accelerate. Stay with us. Margaret Howell will break down how the federalization of the police is coming at us, and we're going to talk to people on the street, get their impressions of what happened in Dallas. We'll be right back. Well, I'm Margaret Howell reporting for Infowars.com. We've seen the Black Lives Matter movement in the news lately, more so than ever the past week, um, in relation to the deaths of Philander Castile and Alton Sterling at the hands of police officers. Now, before we get into the specifics of police shootings and these deaths, I want to play you the president's response these killings. Take a look. When incidents like this occur, there's a big chunk of our fellow citizenry that feels uh, as if because of the color of their skin, they are not being treated the same. And that hurts. And that should trouble all of us. Now, unlike the liberal opportunistic freaks on the left and the neo-Nazis on the right, we actually care about all lives. We care about black people getting shot and killed unjustly in this country, of course. And I hate to see cases like this, but we heard our president use a very troubling narrative. He's race baiting. He's, he's inciting more violence by using the narrative that he is and making this a race issue, making this, making this a one-sided problem and fueling the anger. Now, I want to take you to my second clip. It's of the Dallas shooting. This happening last night where five police officers were killed. Take a look at this footage. horrific footage where a sniper actually gunned down five police officers that were attending to a protest scene. And the troubling issue here is that we're seeing a push now for the federalization of all local police officers in this country. And I want to take you to my third clip. It's a clip of a local sheriff. He told Megyn Kelly that he thinks that federalization of the Chicago police um, is in order because they're causing a murder crisis. Take a listen to what he has to say. I'm trying to figure out why a state of emergency hasn't been declared in parts of city of Chicago, why there's no curfew in place from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. The first thing I need to do is stem the violence at nighttime. Somehow they have to stop the bleeding, but Rahm Emanuel seems incapable uh, of doing this. I just need to know how many more black people have to be shot and killed, like uh, Director Comey said, before somebody thinks that this is an emergency. Now, Sheriff Clark isn't alone in calling for martial law in cities, which aligns with the narrative that we should federalize, nationalize our police force. Al Sharpton has the same sentiment. I brought his clip for you. Take a look at what he says. There must be national policy and national law on policing. We can't go from state to state. We've got to have national law to protect people against... 
please continue question. We hear Al Sharpton akinning the national policing legislation to the Civil Rights Act, and he says there must be a national policy, a national law on policing. We can't go from state to state. We can't trust states with their own laws and regulations. We need to federalize this. We need to, we need to step this up and take control of it. Now, that's in line with what the president is trying to do. He's picked six cities to have nationalized police forces. This is his pilot program. Five million of U.S. taxpayer money has been, has been used to do this. It was launched by Eric Holder um, so that the DOJ could bring police departments under federal control. Now, the call to nationalize our police force and institute martial law in cities to protect citizens from their own police officers, that falls in line with hacked messages of the Black Lives Matter leader um, who these messages actually reveal that the administration has a plan for a summer of chaos and even martial law. I want to read you some of these hacked messages. And on Friday, June the 10th, someone hacked into the Twitter of account of hashtag Black Lives Matter, the leader and former Baltimore mayoral candidate, DeRay McKesson. And this is what was leaked according to this one document, this interaction where the attorney general, um, it's, it's alleged that the attorney general is planning a summer of chaos to cause disruption at the conventions and ultimately institute martial law. Now this exchange of messages between DeRay McKesson and a lady named Johnetta Elzey this is what the conversation included. J.E., have you spoken with Ms. Lynch, Attorney General, recently about the plan for summer and fall leading up to the elections? To which he replies, we spoke two weeks ago. They want us to start really pushing how racist Trump is now instead of waiting so that others can start getting the protests ready to shut both conventions down. Then the conversation continues. If we can get both conventions shut down for messing over Bernie and for having racist Trump, then get martial law declared so Obama can stay in office. We will win. Call you soon when I get to my dad's so I can have his landline and we can talk about this more. So the summer of chaos that they're speaking of, they go on to detail how they're busing people in to create riots. 2,000 people uh, bust in from different cities and another six to 8,000 expected to drive into Cleveland for the convention. They're hoping to cause such mass chaos that martial law has to be declared, possibly even not an election, who knows, but at least Obama gets to stay in office according to these leaked tweets between the two of them regarding our own U.S. Attorney General, Loretta Lynch. Now, this goes hand in hand with the nationalized police force pilot program that's being instituted currently. And if martial law is declared, we might not even see an election. Well, a federal system of policing would be a good idea in theory if we could just ignore all of the problems and elements associated with federal law enforcement lately. That aside for a moment, what we know from these tweets, from this leaked information, is that mass chaos is planned all through the summer, centered around the election, right up until the election. And if they can, they can manage to stop or halt it and declare this martial law as DHS has implemented the plan of nationalized police forces, they just might get away with it. Meanwhile, our president is making this a race issue, pointing out how police brutalize disproportionately black people. And this could be a front for pushing a nationalized police force and ultimately declaring martial law. I'm Margaret Hell reporting for Infowars.com. There's a big chunk of our fellow citizenry that feels uh, as if because of the color of their skin, they are not being treated the same. And that hurts. And that should trouble all of us. Does it hurt as much as 52% uh, of blacks being chopped up in the womb? Does it hurt as much as the government shipping the drugs into the community at the, at the, at the federal level? Does it, does it hurt as much as the black unemployment doubling or the great society with LBJ, you're, you know, the guy you say is great, saying, I'm going to have those N-words voting Democrat for the next 100 years. We're going to give them welfare and break up their families because the black communities, I'm not defending segregation, but what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, to quote Nishi. When my dad was a kid, the nicest areas of town that were big, there were rich areas that were white, but they were small. The nicest areas when they go into town, were the black areas, their own hotels, their own cleaners, their own restaurants, everybody wearing suits. All of it blown away in decades of weaponized media, and it's happened to everybody right now. In the 1920s and 30s and 40s, look it up, 
black households had lower illegitimacy than white households. Now it's upwards of 90%. And that's the same plan for, it's just, it's, it's a, they beta tested it on the black Americans. And now it's being beta tested on everybody and we better wake up to it. Obama is a known predator. He's the black face on the new world order, as we said in the Obama deception. Uh, we also believe that these suspects uh, have threatened to plant a bomb in the downtown area. Uh, we have reached out to our federal law enforcement pa partners, both the FBI and the ATF, uh, to help us search for both the suspects, or maybe it's more, and to do a very thorough search of this uh, area where we believe there might be a bomb planted. I'm here at a monument for Officer John Gaines. John Gaines was an African-American police officer who was killed by a white police officer. And then less than two years later, Tom Allen, the only black officer in Austin at that time, similar to John Gaines, was killed, this time by a black news editor. I'm Ashley Beckford for Infowars.com. I'm here today on the streets of Austin to find out how people feel about the murders that occurred last night in Dallas. Hey, do you care to comment about the shooting last night in Dallas? We're just trying to get people's opinions on how they feel about it. Uh, the Constitution doesn't mention anything about multiple, multiple uh, shooting weapons that can kill more than one person. They were talking about muskets, obviously. Everybody, the NRA knows this, but they just stand by, basically, and twist words in the Constitution. Violence just begets more violence. It, they eat away at each other. It's just not smart. How do you feel about these cops uh, losing their lives last night? It was like five guys were killed and 11 were wounded. Yeah, is it up to five now? Yeah, yeah it was four yeah. yesterday. Five was, were, were confirmed dead. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's terrible. and I think it's close to home. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think the Black Lives Matter movement needs to work together with the police and and we need to come together to solve this uh, the, the problem we have with the, with the with our justice system, and it, it needs to be fixed definitely. Do you think that that's like retaliation for all the killing they've been doing? It could yeah. be. It could be. Yeah. It could be. Yeah. Yeah. It could be. Any other comments on it? No. Everybody needs to understand their role as law enforcement. Right. Cause man, you could. Shoot a person in the the leg or something, make the person go down. Especially if you butt naked. Yeah. He can't. He ain't got no weapon. You know. He just a young black man, strung out a little bit. Right. But not for him to lose his life over. Cops are gang members. You got some gang members, but they they legalize criminals. It, 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 it irritates me too a lot because these officers are not properly trained. I think how they resolved it was how they how they're responsible for, for what they did for, for, for their actions. This is, I can't believe how, how they did it. How they did it was so, like, it was, I don't know, it was, it's violent. like right, violent. But if they start holding them accountable, you, if they start holding them accountable for what they doing, it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't go so far. But they get away with it, they have a badge, and they, you know, they, their mental state is not right, it's hate, they got hating on their heart. Yeah. But now I don't approve that because it's not the guy that shot the, 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 the boy, so why did you kill him long? I feel like it's not the proper response. You don't? No. Okay. I feel like that's still someone's family. Right, but yeah, then I feel like, you know, that's always someone's brother or family or father or someone something. Yeah, that's true. And you never know what that person's personal, what their views weren't, this other person's views and opinions. Mm -hmm. So I feel like you should never really just kill people. Right. <laughs> I really just don't like that idea. But I also feel like it it makes sense. You're getting tired and you're getting frustrated. Exactly. And also, like, there are also like a lot of rumors, like snipers and other things in yeah. the air, so I really just want to hear uh, a valid, clear story of what happened. I'm sad about all the killings, whether it's, you know, a, a young black man getting killed or whether it's a police officer getting killed. I think, you know, violence just begets more violence. And I think, you know, reinstituting this assault weapons ban would be a good thing. It'd be a sensible thing. The NRA is going to fight it tooth and nail. 
but you know much in line with you know my friend here i think it's you know really it's the fascists taking over it, you know, ruining it for everyone else. This guy who was like part of the military and basically he was like trained. So he, I guess he's just tired of all these black men, you know, getting killed. Like the guy in Austin, he was friggin' naked yeah. and they just shot him dead. Obviously he didn't have a weapon. So, I mean, it's one of the things where you're just kind of stuck. Yeah. It's like, yeah, I want to shoot up some people because you know, you did me wrong. You hurt my, you hurt my people. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not getting any really where right now. Yeah. You're, everyone's trying to cover things up, and it's getting frustrating. It's making us angry. Right. But I don't know. Yeah. I feel like there should be some. I don't know. So there you have it. I've been out here on the streets of Austin, Texas, to find out how people are reacting to the shooting that took place last night in Dallas. Five police officers have been killed. And unlike most people here, I believe not only do blue lives matter and black lives matter, but all lives matter. This is Ashley Beckford for Infowars.com. This is not, this is not one person with a, this is a person with, a person with a big neck. A few neck. Is that a cop dead? like this occur, there's a big chunk of our fellow citizenry that feels as if because of the color of their skin, they are not being treated the same. And that hurts. Oi, oi, bang, bang. 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 Oi, oi, bang, bang.